personality and your Everybody emotions. Everybody goes to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. If you got your Bibles, if you don't have it, get it out of online and get the Bible out. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. We're going to start there, but we're going to look at one particular verse. And I've never seen this verse before because we always stop after a certain spot. All right, Galatians chapter 5, verse 32, 22, excuse me. And it reads, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance. Against such, there is no law. That's where we stop. Somebody say, that's where we stop. That's where we stop. But verse 24 is what we need to read. Mm -hmm. And it says, and they, somebody say, they means me. They means me. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with their affections and lusts. That's what she was just talking about. Crucify. You didn't just say crucify your lust, your flesh and your lust. He said your affections. Inside your affections houses your emotions. Somebody say in my affections. In my affections. Are my emotions. Are my emotions. My emotions. No power if if I don't crucify my flesh. Right. That's so good. My emotions have no power. My emotions have no power. No if power. I crucify my flesh. If I don't crucify my flesh. Oh, if I do crucify my crucify flesh. Crucify my flesh. See, the reason why your emotions have as much power as they do is because you have not killed your flesh. Amen. Wow. So it's kind of like pain. When I was in the Marine Corps, they used to have this model that says, mind over matter. If you don't mind, you it don't, don't matter. matter. And what were they trying to tell you, teach us? They were trying to teach us that suffering is, that suffering is a condition of the mind. Y'all, this is what I'm about to teach y'all. Yeah. Suffering is a condition of the mind. It's only suffering when you think you're suffering. Amen. I want to tell you, I want to show you something. Go to verse 25. It says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Now watch this. There's nothing complicated about that. And there's nothing deep about that. Walking in the spirit simply means following simple instructions. Allowing God to lead you daily. Allowing God following, to guide your steps. following simple instructions. Yes. It simply means this. Watch this. If God says that you got to do what I told you to do and it has to be done in a spirit of excellence and it has to be done at a certain time and it has to be done with a certain individual, that means you got to do what I told you to do and it has to be done at a certain time and it has to be done with a certain individual. When you walk in the spirit, you already have a, 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 an inward, an internal crucifier of your flesh. I shouldn't have to tell you. The woman of God shouldn't have had to Tell me. Take your emotions and the flesh out of this. Take your flesh, take your feelings, take your emotions, because your motive should be to please God and accomplish your assignment in the life. It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. It doesn't feel good. It's straightforward. It's to the point. Your hands are clean. But you guys got to understand that your flesh is the biggest blocker of doing God's will. I heard, as this whole conversation was taking place, I heard that's one of the biggest problems in the body of Christ. You can go ahead, take your seat. That's one of the biggest problems in the body of Christ. The leaders don't kill their emotions. Then today, I heard another phrase. You know, you, when you're around <coughs> people who are anointed to help you build or grow or advance on some level, their words are watered in dry places. The phrase was, Satan uses chaos in other people, some variation of this, to unzip you. So that the demonic spirit that has the person bound can now enter into you. If you do not allow them to unzip you, they don't have that, he doesn't have access. Wow. You listening? In killing your emotion and fulfilling your assignment, how many people have you walked away from? Because dealing with them is just too much. No, dealing with them in your flesh and your emotions. It's just too much. If you would have stopped for a moment and crucified your flesh and crucified your emotions and just fulfilled the assignment, 
They would have had nothing to go by or to work with. You would have taken away every weapon of accusation, every weapon of character assassination, every weapon that says you're too dominant, you're overbearing, you're a busybody, you're a manipulator, you're too controlling. None of those weapons would have ever been in their arsenal against you. The only thing they could have ever had was what the word of God said and what the truth was concerning the situation, right. which would have been a mirror to force them to see themselves. But the problem was God was using them to be a mirror to force you to see you. My God. And we don't respond the way we're supposed to always. It's very important that we have somebody around us who loves us, that we trust, who can say, do you want to handle this God's way or do you want to keep your feelings and emotions involved? Let me slide right here. How many of y'all know what the true purposes of your emotions are? Y'all heard me say it before. Y'all should remember this one once it's been around. All right, I'm going to show you. But ever, uh, I'm going to read it. Just write it down in your notes. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10. This is the prophet Elijah talking. And he said, verse 10 says, And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord. Another translation said jealous for the Lord. Jealousy is an emotion. Not just a spirit, it's a spirit attached to an emotion. But he said I was that way for the Lord. So your the true purpose of your emotion is to express the earth realm the real feeling of God concerning the situation. That's why there's that such that phrase righteous anger. Righteous anger is an anger that expresses wrong without doing damage, without condemnation. So when you understand it, the purpose of your emotions, it's not so that it gets the best of you, but it is that so that God would express his desire for us to change, his desire for us to see his will is being done in the earth realm, then we understand that we have to crucify his flesh to the point that he has control of our emotions mm -hmm. so that we can truly express what's on his heart and what's in his spirit. We talk so much about being an example. We talk so much about, about being uh, what God would have us to be. Well, he can't do that if we still have control. See, it's kind of like driving your car. If you take your hands off the steering wheel and press the gas, eventually you're going to run into a ditch. You know why? Because you don't have control. God, you are the same way without God in control. You're going to run yourself into a ditch. That's so good. And so you've got to allow God to still have some control over you. But you can't do it if you have not crucified this flesh. So how do we do that? How do we go about crucifying this flesh on a daily basis? First thing is, is through prayer. First thing is through prayer. Being, being disciplined in prayer. Not just praying, but being disciplined in prayer. Having a regimented time. And, and, and guess what? Everybody's guilty of it all. So ain't nobody bad, feeling bad. We don't pray when we should. We, right. we don't pray when we ought. Or we don't study the word like we need to either. See, a disciplined lifestyle is how you crucify the flesh. What's the purpose of fasting? Fasting is not just for you. To, but exactly, to starve. It's for you to crucify the flesh. Fasting is there for you to, to be more connected with God by crucifying the flesh. Uh, it's, it's not the denial of food. If you're denying yourself the food, you're starving yourself. But if you're fasting, you're seeking some type of spiritual outcome. You're seeking some type of spiritual answer, some type of spiritual result. That's the purpose of fasting. Instead of being disciplined in the word. Those are disciplined. That's why they were disciples. They were being disciplined. They were being trained to be disciplined. And discipline is how you crucify the flesh. And that's why you discipline your children. To crucify that part of their flesh that want to act a fool. 
Okay, Terry. Something that is very key that stood out to me was the importance of identifying the unclean spirits that are in operation. When people are being contentious and combative and disruptive and aggressive, there is an unclean spirit in operation. They have foolishly yielded to the control of that spirit and given it power. So now next thing you're dealing with, you're wrestling with the demon, you're not gonna win. That, here's the reason, because you're thinking the demon wants to kill you, and he doesn't, he needs you alive. He wants to unzip you and access you. Because he has influence over everything you have influence over if he has influence over you. The Bible tells you. He said we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. Come on, everybody. We wrestle not against flesh, flesh and blood. So if you're wrestling against flesh and blood, wrestling in your flesh, you won't lose. You're not wrestling against the person. You're wrestling against the spirit and control of the person. And you, it, you can't fight a spirit in your flesh. That's why you have to crucify. See, the reason why it's hard for us to identify spirits that are operating in people is because the flesh is in the way. It's blinding us. And so we, we say things, girl, if that was me, that's your flesh talking. You know, I, if we say stuff like, I felt like she was being threatened, she was threatening me, and if she threatened me, I got it. That's your flesh talk. You know why? Because that's what the enemy wants. The spirit in operation wants your reaction. Because, it, because if you react in that manner, now the name of God is shamed. Not only that, there's no way for God to be glorified ever in the situation, contrary to popular belief. Say so why? Because why? when you're dealing with an underdeveloped person, emotional, an unintelligent person, a person who's Somebody not intelligent immature. emotionally, an immature individual, you know what you're dealing with? The accuser of the brethren. Because brethren. when they're immature and unlearned and they are offended, they're going to accuse you. They're going to contaminate your influence. They're going to tarnish your witness. They're going to tear your name all the way down to the ground. And what you end up doing is trying to prove your innocence. You gave them the weapons to whip you with. They moved on because they're doing sinners going to do what they do. And you are now left with bruises on your witness. So when it comes time for you to win that soul again, they've lost trust and confidence because they've already been exposed to your carnality and your fleshly side. That's always overpowering in the eyes of a sinner. They have not the ability to see God in you once they've seen your weakness, the weaknesses and the fallacies of your flesh. So it's very important that you don't ever even expose that to them. Because you can show them God for 10 years straight and you can have one flesh moment and you will be permanently labeled in their eyes as the person who cursed them out or who was rude to them or who disrespected them or <coughs> lied to them or manipulated them or abused them. And I, I want y'all to look at it this way too. Because sometimes God is sending that person to you not for, for them to you to deal with them but for you to deal with the person that's connected to them. That's so good. There are people that God will introduce into your life not for you to deal with that individual who's coming to you, but the people that that individual are is connected to. They are the ones that need you the most. You gotta, we gotta understand this about God. God knows who's gonna accept Him and who's not. He knows our heart. He presents everybody with an opportunity to accept Him, but He knows the conditions of our hearts. To know who's going to accept it and who's not. Who's in the position to receive and who is not. Who is open to hear and who is not. And because he knows this, 
He's got to do whatever he can to make sure that those individuals who are ready interact with you so that they can be delivered and set free and saved. But sometimes you got to go through a hurdle to get to the blessing, to get to the soul. And you can't really identify that if you're all caught in the flesh. You can't identify that, Koya, if you allow what they're saying to you to affect your actions. Right. I, and what, what made me think about that is Kenya. Kenya. Kenya came to us by way of her cousin. That's true. Her cousin got married. Actually, she was the third string because yeah, Natalie mom. was here first. first. Natalie mm -hmm. bought Kiva and, and Kiva, Kiva bought, bought Kenya. And it was and and Kiva and Kenya was was who God wanted us to reach. Because the minute Kiva and Kenya came and joined, the mom fell off. Mom left. But we had to deal with the mom. We had to love on the mom. We had to pour into mom. Enough for mom to trust Kiva and Kenya with her, into our hands. Go no one step further. Because as soon as Kenya plugged in and started really walking in her purpose, uh -huh. Kiva fell off. Yep. Because yep. she got married. She went on, went on with her husband. And then the next thing I know, the fact that her, she has grown in the spirit. Her mom loves us to life. Yeah. She didn't really care for me initially because she had that perception of me because she saw her daughter submitting to me and acknowledging me as mom. But, but watch this. I had a conversation with her. And here comes bus kidney. I had a conversation with her. And I said, your daughter was about to fat four when she came in here. Your daughter was smoking weed and sleeping with folk, throwing that thing in a circle. Boys and girls all over the world. And I said, God has used this ministry to birth deliverance in her life. I said, I'm not trying to take your place because you can give her something I could never give her. But I need you to understand that God has used me to give her something you can never give her. I said, we both love her. We both have her best interest at heart. And we both want what God wants for her. Is that the truth? She said, yes. I said, I want to run in your lane. Don't you run in mine. She didn't come around right away, but it took about a month and she popped up in the church again. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you, we've never had another conversation about it. And we're like Why this. Call you baby mama I, 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 we call each other baby mama. <laughs> you know why? That's our baby and we're both mamas. <laughs> right. but, but there's a respect because I've done nothing. I've done nothing but show love and live God to the best of my ability in this woman's presence. So there is nothing that she could pull from. And other people in the family tried to come against me, and she stood up for me. I didn't even know it on Facebook. Oh, she did? She yeah. stood up for me. The cousin, Kiva's sister, had some negative things to say about something that was, Kenya did a post thanking her mom. I think it was a Mother's Day post. She acknowledged me and her birth mom. And the other one, that you only have one mom, and I don't believe in this, and this, and that, and the other. And my baby mama stood up and said, that is a mama. God has used her to, you know, a really birth a child. And I'm thankful to what God has done or something, some variation of that. I didn't have to defend myself. Because the, the people who need to know what my assignment in her life is, they know and understand. And we all respect each other. I need my baby mama. She knows things that I don't know. She's had experiences that I haven't had. And, and look at this. We always, because I'm preaching and she's not yet. We always think that if we're the preacher, we're ahead of the person or we're better. No, no, no. We got to be careful not to do that. Because your blessing, your answer might be in the one that's sitting on the pew, not standing in the pulpit. Yeah. Does that make sense? Come on, let's wrap this up. So I, I want y'all to just, y'all come on with this stuff. I want y'all to understand that uh, your goal. In day by day, it's not just to please God, but it's also to crucify His flesh, so that it does not get in the way of your efforts of pleasing God. I thank God for 
uh, the opportunity of being here because I learned from every one of y'all. So I learned something good. I learned something bad about myself. I learned about things that I need to work on. I, you know, I realized, you know, one of the, I'll give you a prime example. One of the things I learned from me, I, I got I to gotta up my forgiveness level. I forgive easy, but Lynn taught me I need to up my forgiveness level. I thought I was at the open level of forgiveness. I said, uh oh, I need to work on that. There's a level to my forgiveness. So I need to up and uh, increase my forgiveness level. You know, and so you, I, I learn from you. You can learn. And so you can sometimes forgive just Listen, I'm going to tell y'all something. You want to know how, how well your flesh has been crucified? Your, through your ability to forgive. If it takes you a long time to forgive, then your flesh has not been crucified for long. If it takes you a long time to give, you got to work on crucifying your flesh. If you're a person like me that has learned to forgive quickly, then your flesh is, has, has suffered some deaths. I want to just say this before we go. You guys are going to prepare your house ahead of time. Whatever God has led you to give. I want to just say this. As a result of me walking in genuine, sincere forgiveness and allowing God to heal me, you know what happened? I got booked to come and preach last week in Florida at a women's conference. And then I was the only one that ministered twice in the whole conference. They had me to do a workshop. And guess what the workshop was on? Forgiveness. forgiveness. You know why? Because the person hosting the conference had witnessed me walking in true forgiveness the way God intended. And she wanted that to be released on the other women in the body. People, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's important that we obey God in the hard thing because that's what's going to produce breaking. That's what's going to produce oil. That's what's going to birth deliverance in the lives of the people. Now jump up on your feet. Y'all give it up to our video ministry leader, Miss Ecclesia Lee. Doing a great job. You can go ahead and cut the video because this last thing that I want to say is for...